Today I'm going to show you just how the speed of Formula One has evolved, show you the key breakthroughs and the constant battle between the FIA and the teams over the performance of the cars. And this is it, the Driver61 F1 lap time evolution. But let me first explain how we got to this point. We've broken down the data of every fastest lap of every race in Formula One history, all to understand the relative pace difference between each year. And then I'm going to show you when the key rule changes came in and how they affected things. So how have we done this? Well, a lot of the raw data was collected by a member of the F1 community on Reddit, and we've linked this below so you can check it out. And I've analyzed the data for us to come out with some real insights. It's as simple as researching every fastest lap from every race ever, and then comparing these to each other to get a percentage difference compared to the previous car at the same circuit a year before. So if the fastest lap at Spa in 1950 was four minutes and 34.1, and the next year was four minutes and 22 seconds, this comes to a difference of 4.51%. Now on its own, this isn't that valuable, but when you do this for every track on the calendar and average it out, you can begin to see the relative difference between one year's car and the next. Sometimes the progression in engineering and technology means the cars get quicker, and sometimes the rule changes mean the cars get slower. Then all you have to do is do this for every year and we're done. Except it's not quite that simple. For example, Spa is very different now to how it was back then. The same goes for Silverstone, Monza, and well, every other circuit on the calendar. So to solve that issue, each time the track is changed, it's treated as an entirely different track and then isn't counted unless there's a time from the previous year to compare it to. But what's handy is that the tracks change quite infrequently. So you can use ones that haven't changed to work out the rough time difference on ones that have. So on the year that Spa changed, both Monaco and Monza didn't. So we can use this as a baseline to compare the two. Now this is by no means perfect. Despite there being a decent sample of data and lots of track types and conditions to average out, there are some things that will affect times, like the tires being used, can they change them in a race? Are the cars using a brand new engine and therefore can burn it out? Is there a tire wall pushing tire performance on? Are cars allowed to refuel? Are the drivers stopping deliberately to fit new tires and get the fastest lap? And yes, all of these things matter, but this does give us the best picture possible. But none of this data makes any sense without some context. So I'm going to go over the major rule changes and explain the differences in the cars. And back in the 50s, the lap times were all over the place. The first couple of years, they were run under Formula One regulations. And then for 1952 and 53, the F1 championship was run under Formula Two regulations to increase participation. And for the next few years, the cars will run with the engines mounted in the front and then move to mounting the engines in the middle or in the rear. Now this made a massive difference, significantly improving cornering ability by reducing some of the colossal understeer the 1950s cars suffered with. The engine choice was pretty free, but the tire technology here was the issue. Tires were very hard and very skinny. So power wasn't the bottleneck, it was cornering ability. Lotus then pioneered the move to lighter aluminium monocoque cars rather than having much heavier space frame designs. Now you can see some huge differences here. From one year to the next, cars were improving between five and 10 seconds a lap. Now back then, the cars could either run as naturally aspirated or with a compressor, a supercharger. And the 1960s started with a big change. They banned these compressors as well as moving from a 2.5 litre engine to a 1.5 litre engine. Now this creates a massive spike in lap time as the cars were definitely underpowered. There was also a push for improving safety systems like the addition of fireproof fuel tanks, seat belts and helmets. Now in 1966, they opened up the engine regulations, moving from 1.5 litre to three litre engines after sports cars being essentially quicker than Formula One at this time. Now this slope here is where engineers really got into their stride, optimizing the engines for maximum efficiency and adapting handling to gain time in the corners. It was one of the fastest progressions in lap time over the entire history of Formula One. We end the mid-engined era in 1977 with the beginning of the aero era. These were the first aerodynamic wings seen in Formula One, and you can see again, another acceleration in performance. The 1970s was when the cars started to get wider, incorporating new aero and gaining more and more power. The cars improved greatly throughout this time until a real turning point in 1976. This was when Nicky Lauda had his near fatal crash at the Nürburgring and it meant the safety procedures were thoroughly reconsidered. Air boxes on top of the cars were banned to limit horsepower, as well as adding safety structures around the pedal box and the entire front of the car. The next significant movement was kicked off by the Lotus 78, introducing ground effect. You can see here it was a massive turning point in Formula One, taking aerodynamic grip to another level. This effectively turned the floor of the car into a wing and the 78 basically sucked itself to the floor, producing ridiculous levels of downforce. 
Now, as the other teams copied this, lap times plummeted throughout this era. Now, this downforce wasn't as predictable and consistent as it is when using a wing. So there were many crashes and these often happened at incredible speeds. Now, the FIA didn't knock this back until 1981 by banning flexible skirts, the components that ran down the side of the car to seal off the floor. And mandating rigid versions led to much less downforce. They also brought in ride height restrictions to aid this. However, the teams had other ideas. They used hydraulic suspension systems to lower the car whenever it left the pit lane and raise it when it came back, meaning the FIA couldn't prove what ride height they were using. However, this seemed to not be enough. So in 1983, the FIA banned the use of skirts altogether, mandating a complete completely flat floor and essentially ending the ground effect era. Now you'll see two trends here. Between the 50s and the 80s, there were massive improvements in performance, often knocked back by fairly infrequent changes in the regulations. However, when we get to the 70s and 80s, something changes here. Safety becomes a real priority and the FIA stay on top of performance with really regular changes knocking back the speeds of the cars. Whenever the FIA knock them back, the teams gain back this lost performance very quickly. Now, instead of turning towards aerodynamics to improve lap times, the team started to have a race to have the most power. They did this using the 1.5 litre V6 engines and they fitted enormous turbochargers. The power in qualifying trim got upwards of 1400 horsepower at times and the speed shot up. Up. The FIA first tried to limit the power by putting strict limits on the size of the fuel tank, but the teams began cooling fuel to cram more and more into the tanks. This first effort didn't really work, so the FIA then mandated a 4 bar boost limit in 1987 and then a 2.5 bar in 1988, before banning turbos altogether in 1989. The start of the 90s was the start of the naturally aspirated era. Speeds were knocked back slightly in 92 when the FIA narrowed the front wings, but at this point it was a massive arms race between McLaren and Williams. This is really where technology excelled and electronics became a large element of the car's performance. Traction control, ABS, launch control and active suspension were on the majority of cars in the 93 season. Cars were able to run engines up to 3.5 litres but could run anything between 8 and 12 cylinders, so there was a brilliant variety with V12s in the Ferrari, V10s in the McLaren, as well as a few cars running V8s. However, 1994 was one of the most tragic years in F1 history. The FIA banned all driver aids, the systems that were keeping these extremely powerful and tricky cars on the road. And after 12 years of no deaths in Formula One, Ayrton Senna and Roland Ratzenberger both died in the San Marino Grand Prix. This led to a massive increase in lap time for the rest of 94, with changes to the height of the front and rear wings, a plank fitted to the floor, as well as changing 27 high-risk corners on the F1 calendar. In 95, the FIA reduced the engine capacity to 3 litres and improved the safety cell of the cars. And in 97, we start the V10 era. And whilst the teams at this time weren't mandated to be using the V10s until about 2000, it was the solution that the majority of teams turned the V10 was a great middle ground between the power of the V12 and the simplicity and reliability of the V8. In 1998, the cars first adopted the narrow track, essentially making the cars a maximum of 1.8 meters. This didn't end until 2017. This was also the year where they moved to groove tires and significantly reduced grip. We start the 2000s and this is when budgets started to rise to near what they are today after an influx of cigarette and car manufacturer sponsorships. The V10s were swapped out for 2.4 litre V8s in 2006 and these engines could rev well over 20,000 RPM, the highest in F1 history. And really the story here is that there are a load of innovations that teams came up with to gain an edge on their competitors and most of them were banned after one or two years. These are things like the tuned mass damper, double diffuser and blown exhaust, as well as many more. There was also a move to having hundreds of aerodynamic surfaces on the car with them looking more and more complicated every year until 2009 where the FIA banned almost all of them except the front and rear wing. Slick tires were back to give some more grip, but the wings were very, very tightly controlled. Now we all know this story. The reduction in downforce was supposed to be as much as 50%, but many teams, namely Braun GP, discovered various tricks like the double diffuser to steal back some downforce. This was also the year where the FIA introduced KERS. However, the weight penalty for carrying this system in the car was pretty large, so less than half of the grid ran this for the first season. 2010 then brought a return to the ban on mid-race refueling. So bear that in mind for the rest of these times. The times following 2010 are fastest laps, but the cars have to carry a full tank of fuel for the race. Whereas before this, cars may have been light for the start of the race and able to set some good times on new tires. These will have been averaged out, but it's worth noting. The 2010s were more of the same. The team's coming up with something like the F-duct and it was banned for the next season. 
DRS was also implemented and Curves was back in all of the cars. Then in 2014, the V8s were out and there was the controversial introduction of the V6 turbo hybrid engines. These were much more efficient, but didn't make the same incredible sound that the V10s and V8s did. And since then, the majority of regulation changes have been focused on aerodynamics, changing the noses, front and rear wings, and the profile of the floor. In 2017, the narrow track era ended and the cars were now two meters wide. They also increased the width of the tires, the width of the front and rear wings, as well as increasing freedom in design for the barge boards. Now this starts the era of the fastest cars in F1 history, with many lap records being broken every single year, including the fastest lap in F1 history, first with Kimi Raikkonen in 2018, and then Lewis Hamilton in 2020. Now because all these times are on a made up track, I wanted to add some perspective. So we've added in Formula 2, Formula 3 and Formula 4 2020 lap times to give this some comparison. So you can see it's not until 1973 where these F1 cars overtake the current Formula 4 which has much less power, they're very light but they have a decent amount of aero. And the same goes for Formula 3 not until 1984 and then Formula 2 where F1 overtakes it in 91 and then gets very close again in the mid 90s. Now a lot of what matters in getting these lap times is the engines inside the car so you should watch this video I made going over every engine layout in all of Formula One history, explaining how they differ, how the power increased, and how we've got to the incredible efficiency we have in today's cars. Thank you very much for watching. Do hit like and subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next one.